Folks, I'm going to introduce Betty Moen. She's the founder and director of uh, Cedar Crest Academy and Early Childhood Center. The academy was dedicated in 1984 by Dr. Deming, and their mission continues to accelerate and support creative learning. Every day, Betty is a teacher of students, parents, and teachers. Elementary speech and language education plus neuropsychology are the foundation that Betty utilizes to support educational practice. She enjoys a joyful life uh, that's generated through more than 40 years of classroom teaching, private practice, and administration. Her presentations and publishing have been in the fields of learning disabilities, language development of twins. Do you have twins? I don't. Okay. Reading comprehension of pre-adolescent females, teacher evaluation, and an urban school model for achievement. Betty daily practices the art of teaching on three grandchildren, two children, and a Deming disciple, who happens to be her husband, Ron Moen, who will speak tomorrow. Uh, with that, please help me welcome Betty Moen. Thank you. Have you had fun today? It's, isn't it fun to be in a learning model or mode and not have to be responsible for somebody else's learning right now? It's so much fun. And for a person who practices with students every single day, some 8 to 12 hours a day, I am very excited about the possibility that there are many of us who really want to make a difference in American children's education. And really, it's much greater than American students. It applies all over the world. Um, a few months ago, I was in China, and it was pretty obvious that I was a Westerner. And so the Chinese students desiring to practice their English came to me and tried to speak to me. And I had had an occasion at Cedar Crest in the early spring to have that same experience, but with Chinese educators visiting our school. And my students, my four-year-olds, eight-year-olds, no matter where I took these people, my students eased up to them shyly and ni hao, ni hao, ni hao, because they weren't sure if they were Chinese or Japanese at first. But the minute they got responses back, they got very excited. And the Chinese educators also got very excited. And they were comfortable. It wasn't like bringing businessmen into an environment of four-year-olds or 12-year-olds. I was bringing educators. And so they started spontaneously counting, uh, using all the phrases that they knew to entertain or engage the Chinese educators. And so the same thing happened to me is that students, young children wanting to learn English, somehow or another realized that I was an educator. Certainly I was a Westerner. And so they wanted to practice their English with me. And it was entirely a joyful experience for both of us. Today, we've learned a lot of great things. And I suspect that every person in this room is fully aware that one, we need to change education, transform it, I believe someone said today. And I'm pretty sure that we all know how to do it. Even the students in this room who are studying education know how to do it. So what is it that makes changing it so elusive? And that's what we're going to talk about today. And for the most part, I'm not going to do a whole lot of telling. I'm going to hopefully give you an experience for you to dig down deep inside of yourself, the true Deming model, and find the courage, use your know-how and all those dendrites and ex, uh, axons firing to change the systems that you're in or that your children are in or that your grandchildren are in. There's a new film out, I haven't seen it, I don't even know the name of it, in which uh, a young teacher and a mother in a school change a school. And I'm quite certain that it can be done. So 
but we need the inspiration to do so. So one of the things I'm challenging you for is to do it. The other is, is let me support you in doing that. So when you're discouraged or when you have a problem, you could email me. You could call me on the phone. And that's the commitment I want to make to educators who are running into barriers and parents who can't find a way to get their child educated appropriately. So today, that is my gift because I suspect that this is nothing new learning for you. I'm very interested in schools where students and teachers achieve results. And they don't happen <coughs> separately from each other. Every time we heard today, we heard a teacher stay in education because it was more joyful, it was more engaging, she was getting more accomplished. And so I want to keep that thinking alive for us all. The model is very, very simple. This is the proof that I have. This is my students who um, are kindergarten through grade eight, and these are their achievement scores last year. I measure them on a standardized achievement test every single year. And I graph that achievement year by year, orange in first grade, blue in second grade, yellow in third grade, so that we watch that trend through the years. And all of them are, as you can see, functioning above norm. How do we do this? And that's what we want to talk about today. So it can be done. I also want to encourage you to realize that I am absolutely confident that you can do this in non-homogeneous cultural groups. 40% of my population is international, and we accomplish these results. I don't take students in grade at age four or two or five. I take them all of the time. So this year, I have four new sixth graders in my class of sixth graders that are going to not be at the level that my sixth graders are coming in. And we still get these results. We look at each student as a Rubik's Cube in light of their chronological age, their learning style, and their emotional development. None of that is new to you. Chronological age, commonly called developmentally appropriate curriculum. Learning style, a lot of what we just heard in our plenary session in terms of neuroscience. And emotional development, which is exceedingly variable across our society and across every society and from whence children come. The purpose of looking at students individually has three pieces for the system of our school. One is individualized for students. Not for a few students, for all students. We individualize so that a child has an opportunity to be in their optimal zone of development. So I was really excited to hear in the neuroscience segment that that optimal zone is a thought of consideration. I'm not just interested in creating a great system. I'm interested in creating amazing students learning. And you can only do that when you individualize. We individualize from three perspectives. We individualize based on neuroscience and how children learn. So in my pre-algebra class, commonly called transitions math, I have students generally that have not quite been as successful in mathematics. They're sixth graders. They should be in algebra one. They're not quite capable of the skills for Algebra 1, so they go into a pre-algebra or transitions class. Mostly not because their comprehension is poor, 
but mostly because they haven't learned to do the detail that's necessary in mathematics. And so this is the individualization process, is finding out how students learn. Maya, in my pre-algebra class, needs me to do lots of explaining. Paco needs me to draw graphs on the board. And that is what we know about our students, and we apply it to their personal educational plan. Now, some of you who are teachers say, I have 32 or 42 people in my classroom. And I say, you probably only have four or a maximum of six learning styles or patterns that would necessitate you to adapt for all of them. And so you need to be aware of those pieces and allow students to group and co-group so that learning it improves in the areas that they're not so strong in and that it also gives them support of all the things that they do. It's very, very important if we are going to gain global recognition of achievement of American students, particularly, if we do not individualize because we are losing an enormous number of students who are not able to accelerate possibility. So therefore, we get them to high school and we say to them, you should be learning physics. You should be learning calculus or pre-calc. But they have not had the foundation. You cannot teach high school students physics, chemistry, high levels of mathematics, and language skills if they have not had that opportunity at an early stage. So a third grader who you think is capable of learning high school physics in middle school or Algebra 2 needs by third grade to be invested in more than grade level curriculum. How does this occur? It occurs in multi-age classrooms. So in any classroom, whether it's reading or spelling or mathematics or sometimes science as well, and I'll tell you why sometimes, those areas may have as many as two or three grade levels in that section. So in this classroom of science students, it's a second grade classroom. The teacher who teaches it only teaches science to lower school students. It is her specialty. It is her passion. It is her expertise. And she has students in her classroom there that are first grade through third grade. In this case, they are sorting some materials, wood, metal, and other. And she's mostly invested in them learning to write lab reports. So she's teaching, the, she's using a simple concept that they easily understand scientifically to teach them the science of writing a lab report. And she's using multi-age and she's regrouping children daily for what the needs are. All this is a preschool classroom of three and four year olds learning to speak Chinese and practicing their Chinese. So it is all very hands-on learning. It is an opportunity for children to play with the toys, play with the things that they are learning. So she's teaching the vocabulary for zoo animals, in this case, giraffe. We assess students every year to design what their needs are for the next year. A student that falls down in vocabulary, we put with a teacher next year that is very strong in language arts and in particular in reading comprehension skills. So we are looking at students and what their needs are based on those assessments. Do we make mistakes? We do but at the risk of leaving a student unprepared and unremediated, we make that jump to react to the data. We also don't count on just standardized data, but we use teacher observation, which is the most powerful of all. Teachers 
collaborate all the time. A student who's making 100% in spelling week after week after week should not be placed in that material any longer. They need to be in a grade level up or two, and we make that happen immediately, simply based on teacher observation. The child in a reading group who is reading, he's second grader, reading in a second grade text, looking out the window, sleeping, playing with little objects. We start testing them right away to see what they are capable of reading and put them in a fourth grade reading group if that is needed. So always looking for that opportunity to individualize for the student. Some students are much more interested in Chinese than they are in uh, Japanese, or maybe they're more interested in that than art. And we would give them an opportunity. If they're in second grade and they're desperate to learn Chinese, and art is that time for second graders or third graders, we look at how we can move that schedule around for that child to have more Chinese and maybe a little less art, and maybe even no art. So every student is looked at as an individual education plan. This is commonly called special ed in public school systems. We say this is an opportunity for to, uh, us to address a student's individual learning style, learning capability, and challenge. And you can imagine what this does for motivation. It soars. Students are engaged almost all of the day. They are excited about going there. I was just saying at lunch that, um, or this morning, that I had yesterday had a student who came in. He's a eighth grader, and he had a physics. Um, they were doing this big physics uh, project at 8:30 in his class, and he came to my office about 10 o'clock, and he had a fever of 102. And I said, I think it's time to go home. And he was like. I know, but I had to get my project presented. I was so excited about it. I've been working on it for two and a half weeks. And I said, is it okay if you go home now? And he conceded. So they want to come to school. How do parents find all of this experience? Generally, fairly daunting. They would rather see it as a competition. Our students don't see it as a competition at all. The fact that a second grader is in a fourth grader's science class or language class or math class doesn't seem to phase students whatsoever. And for the most part, in this room, that's the kind of classroom that we have. And so it's a real life experience. Parents, however, have not been educated in that same way. And sometimes, not often, they will come to us and say, so-and-so is here. I want my child to be there also. And so it takes a dialogue with a parent who has that thinking in order to compensate for their thinking versus the child's need. The next project that we use in the individualization or process is neuroscience. And this is something that for the most part our undergraduate and graduate degrees are pretty lean in, is how students learn. And I'll tell you why. Because we're still learning about this. And we just heard this wonderful uh, lecture in some new things that are being do done and some new connections. And if anyone is at all interested in that subject matter, I am working uh, in a new book now called Connect Tones that has wonderful work and wonderful thinking. And will it inspire you to really think about the development of children's brains? Um, I just spoke with a fifth grade teacher and I was explaining to him that in the airport last night I watched a child that must have been, I know he was not more than 15 months old, and he, just watching him connect to the world. He was uh, going behind the barriers, trying to get to the glass wall to see the airplanes. He was, uh, somebody uh, drummed on a railing, and pretty soon he was drumming on the railing too, and then he went over and drummed on this railing, then he drummed on the mother's knee, and very quickly you could see the connections that this less than 15-month-old child was making. And yet we look at five-year-olds 
and don't allow them to, uh, to read at second grade level if they can do that. I want to show you a bit of a slide. This is my kindergarten class reading in second grade reading text, and this is how they do it to keep five-year-old bodies in um, tact, <laughs> to keep them doing it. They call it popcorn reading. So they're reading. First they sit down and read. They popcorn up, move to the next book, and read the next page. Popcorn up, move to the right, sit down, read the page. And these are all five-year-olds, but pretty much. I would say there's a few four-year-olds in there probably too. So four or five, and there might even be a six-year-old in that group, okay, that are reading second grade material published for second grade, but they're reading it at a, in a kindergarten class because they can. And how do we make it appropriate for a five-year-old? My teacher invents popcorn reading. So there are many ways that we look at neuroscience and developmentally appropriate. And I'll talk about that in a moment. These are some of the markers in neuropsychology that we use. The variation between a child's receptive and expressive language. Organization of self to accomplish tasks. This is Vygotsky's work, which is very, we're using profoundly in ages three through five. Phonetic versus visual word recognition. How competent are they in these areas? Language retrieval and working memory. The learning of idiomatic elements of written language and spelling. Doubled consonants. C-I-A-L, T-U-R-E. Vowels. How do stu students learn vowels and when do they learn the vowel understanding? Making them, producing them, identifying them in word recognition, and analyzing them. How are students learning visually, spatially, and auditorily? As we move to the adolescent, problem solving versus procedural or computational uh, learning. I'm, I often look at... Uh, on the group achievement test, I often look at the difference between problem solving subtest and the computational or procedural subtest. And I have students that will score as much as 40 points difference in those two. And that is a lot. That is a lot. That's extreme. And so what we did was we started looking at why, first of all. And guess what we discovered was the why? This is a fourth grader that has that much difference in their procedural and problem solving, who was in Algebra 2 as a sixth grader. Sixth grader taking Algebra 2. In Algebra 2, those of you in high school education, anybody computing with pencil and paper on very often? A little bit, but mostly using a calculator. And so they had become so accustomed to using calculation calculators for simple problem solving that they did poorly on a fourth grade achievement test in computation. It had, was beside them. Another one in the same vein was word study skills. In third grade, nobody is, under, working, um, nobody is worried about how they're word recognizing. Are they using phonics? What's the short A? Where's the short A vowel in the word fish? Nobody's worrying about that at third grade, not at our school anyway. And they were scoring very poorly on that subtest because they hadn't done that since they were in kindergarten. So these are some of the aspects of individualizing that we uh, work with. We also look at a student's genetic handedness, especially uh, we look at that compared to, especially if they're using both, at least by age seven. We're looking at what handwriting looks like uh, before the age of seven, when the bone between the hand and the arm is not totally fused. And so what are you using to control that handwriting stroke? Muscle. How long does it take a muscle? Everybody get up and uh, let's uh, do squats for five minutes and let me see how long your quads um, don't, you know, last. Okay, they start screaming. Just like this muscle in the hand starts screaming of a five-year-old trying to write. 
So even though this group of kindergarten students can read at second grade level, what do you think their function is in writing? Much less than second grade reading. They can't work in a workbook. They write bigger than the lines they give them. They can't write long stories, but they can tell you long stories. And so how you adapt curriculum is based on those elements. So besides using neuroscience, we also use lots of multi-age learning. So this is a classroom of fourth through fifth, fourth and fifth graders. There's a few third graders in there as well. And so they're working on editing. So this is a student's work that they submitted maybe two days ago. And we're going to work with this group of students to do some editing to learn better syntax, uh, better expression. We're going to help you find better words, more adjectives, and better verbs for your writing paper. They actually typed it, sometimes by a hunt and peck method. But we start working with word processing skills or typing skills at about third grade. This is a multi-age group of students in, uh, that are taking curriculum into the humanities and the art, arts. So I'm going to stop there for a moment and talk about the concept of developmentally appropriate. How many are just, if you're an educator, that sort of rings in your ears. And my theory about developmentally appropriate is it's a myth. And it's a myth because just like the little child, 15 months, curious, my uh, two-and-a-half-year-old grandson, he can use an iPad better than I can. That little old finger that's half the size of mine can flick that iPad faster than I could ever possibly do so. And so, again, students are learning much, many more, they're making many more connections than our developmentally appropriate model fits. And we need to be adjusting to that thinking. We also utilize movement a great deal in the classroom. Uh, besides popcorn reading, it is not uncommon for me in my pre-algebra class to um, there happens to be a fire door in my classroom. It doesn't ring when uh, you open it. Uh, for me, to, they, they've really, they're working pencil and paper because we spend at least 20 minutes out of every 55-minute minute class period. We spend it in computational pr problem-solving practice, if you want to call it that. And um, so they will just be like zoned. I mean, they will be just so concentrating. And they're concentrating so much that I'm like, I'm almost nervous watching them because they're just like, they're just working as fast and as hard and as accurately as they possibly can. And so I'll say to them, stop. And I open the fire door. <laughs> it doesn't go off. Alarm doesn't go off. And I say to them, run to the end of the parking lot. And they all like, okay. I mean, they're happy to do so. And they come back into the classroom and, we'll, I'll, and sometimes I'll trick them and say, you're going to do it four times. Sometimes I say, oh, you just get a half today. Uh, so I'm constantly varying that movement and activity and bring them back in the classroom. They're refreshed, and they come right back in and focus the rest of the 40-minute period. So it's been so common for us as teachers as, my gosh, we've got them down there. We've got them focused. They're sitting. They're still. They're going at it. Keep them moving, right? No, stop them from doing that. Stop them in that action and give them refreshment because they're going to stop themselves very shortly because their brain will not tolerate that kind of intensity. So movement is very, very important. I might add that we have a campus, so we're not in one building. We have a classroom building. We have a gymnasium that you have to walk about 40 yards to. We have music studios, art studios, and our foreign language studios are all in different buildings. And so as young as five years old, students start moving around our campus, and this gives them the refreshment and the movement to be ready to concentrate fully. And we're very, very invested in that, in making students, uh, improving their attention, improving their focus, and helping them uh, get their brain in a flow sort of uh, motion. 
The next thing that we do to individualize is student accountability. And that is that we pay attention to our students and how often they don't get their homework in or how often they uh, are late to class. Um, and I love the solution today is start on time. That's a great idea. I took that down today in, from David or uh, someone in that group. And the opportunity for them to be in charge of that. And so, of course, we have an electronic system that both they and their parents can go into that gives them, that sort of helps them know when they haven't been accountable. And so we're looking at students acquiring mastery at 85% of the content that we present to them. And so we need to know if they're not getting their homework done and why they're not getting their homework done. And one of the things we enacted this year is that math tests can only be on Thursday. English uh, projects and papers and tests can only be on Fridays. And on Wednesday is science and Tuesday is foreign language. And so that everybody gets a day. And sometimes that takes some really good juggling of curriculum, but it gives students a consistency of prediction in regard to how they plan both their sport life, their non-academic life, and their academic life. One of the cre uh, main functions of individualizing is what we do with teachers. And that is, teachers do not teach things that they don't like. You always have the choice from year to year. Fifth grade teacher comes to me and says, I want to teach second grade next year, and I kind of anticipate that there's going to be a lot of second graders. And so that person is certainly given an opportunity to do so. We probably spend a lot of time talking and dialoguing about why she wants to go there and, uh, and what she has to offer that situation. One of the goals we had this year was we wanted to create more fluidity between our lower school science program and our 4-5 science program. At fourth grade, we start using middle school curriculum, earth science in fourth grade, because that's pretty friendly to nine-year-olds, physical life science in fifth grade, physical science in sixth grade, and then to high school biology for seventh graders and a foundations course of chemistry and physics in eighth grade. So our gap was between our lower school and our fourth grade unit. And so my fourth grade teacher said, I think I can solve this. And I was like, okay, what do you have in mind? And she said, I'd like to teach earth science next year. And that way she would be the bridge between the, the three hours of hands-on activity out of five a week, three hours of hands-on activity out of five in science in lower school, whereas in fourth grade and up, it starts to drop to about two, two and a half of five hours because more textual material, more curriculum, more explorations uh, uh, electronically are uh, available to a student. And so we started thinking about how we can make that happen for older students. The other thing that we do is uh, we look at how subject matter can be integrated. And this is to our second piece. So the first piece is to individualize for our students and constantly thinking how we're gonna do that. The second piece is how do we make our curriculum engaging? And how do we make it inquiry-based? How do we make it experiential? And the number one way that we started, this is how we started it, we started it by putting benchmarks on how much hands-on activity would be in science per week out of the number of hours that was, were given. And it sort of helps you get a clear uh, picture of what is not going on in your, in your system. So in lower school science, three of five hours of science a week were hands-on. So in fourth grade, we moved to 2.5. And in upper school, it's generally about two hours of five hours a week in physics, chemistry, or biology that are hands-on. And so that is a very, very important way to move up the acceleration bar, keep students in the zone of optimal development, 
and also give teachers an opportunity to gear and plan for the activity that they're doing. Uh, Chris today told me as a new principal, he said, I have a new, build, new building, you know, I'm the new principal, and, and right away he said to me, and I have a new staff. And I, so when he said, I have a new staff, I hope his whole faculty isn't here, this will be embarrassing. Uh, okay. when he, I said, oh, new staff, are they also a young staff? He was like, yeah. And he had this sort of like scary, either like he had to tell me they were young and I shouldn't expect much, or that was a big burden to him. I don't know, I didn't ask. But I said to him, good for you, good for you. Because for the most part, and those of you who are students in this group, I want this to truly be an encouragement to you. You are the blood, you are the uh, pulse of school systems in the future because you're going to take your ideas and new ideas into school systems and you're going to be able to utilize them if you convince the leadership of your school to help you to collaborate with you in that regard. So ignore a lot of your professors who said, don't send students who misbehave to the office because they'll think that you can't manage students. And that was the first thing I had, one of the first things I had to teach my rookie teachers is please send disruptive students to me so that I can have time to find out why they're disrupting and what this is going and what kind of a plan of action that we're going to take. Now, ultimately, I involved the teacher, and that teacher then had a great opportunity to learn from an old hand like me who's been in the classroom for 40 years how we might have a behavioral interaction that would be more positive for that student. So be careful of uh, not, not accepting new rookies into the environment because they have so many great ideas having come out of the university. And rookies to be or soon to be, please make sure that you make a difference by changing the system. That is going to be the uh, dictum for today is for our students of elementary and uh, education in general is to go forth to change the systems because it might be the only way it changes. So the second process that we utilize at Cedar Crest to meet and get the results is a very highly process or cognitive or experiential learning curriculum. So here Everywhere you've seen in my slides, students drawing, students hands-on in science. They are there for a few moments there. Students jumping up and down as they read. Students using language activities, a conversational to learn. All of my students generally go into a second or third year of French or Spanish or Chinese after they leave eighth grade with us. So they've had lots of experiences with foreign language. So here is a first grader. So everything is original. Everything, there is no duplicated worksheets. I was so happy to hear the teacher today talk about get rid of the worksheets in your building. Have children drawing, have children writing. And these, we just have thousands of examples, and this is my very best to, of this week. This is my second graders who are learning about igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock. Can you tell which is which? Now, I want you to know that I wasn't sure that adults would be able to do this, and so I ask all, a lot of adults this week, can you tell me where the igneous rocks are, where the sedimentary, and where the metamorphic rocks are on this second grade watercolor? Most couldn't. But every student in second and third grade were able to do this. The third graders, why were they able to do it? Because they did it last year. Because they learned about igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. One of my mothers said, we have a rock tumbler. It goes on all the time. We put rocks in it, huge, small. And she said, I wondered why my second grade son was going through the rocks in this big box, picking out the ones that he wanted to put in the tumbler. And she said, and he was using all of this vocabulary prolifically. 
This is watercolor. And this is a teacher who made the bridge from lower school science to fourth grade science because she knew she would be able to put more hands-on activity with her students. And I think it's gorgeous. And it's also very interesting. This is a fourth grade biome. So this kind of project, experiential learning, is two to three hours of every single five in science. The book was Elijah of Buxton. This is a character web. This was not a duplicated sheet that was given by the language arts teacher in a fifth grade classroom. This was a piece of paper that was handed out. And this is what it became. This is a coral reef biome created with some sort of clay and then created in a miniature aquarium. Lots, and, and this is constant all the time. We have this stuff everywhere. We have a stinky, we have a stinky school. We have clutter everywhere. We have sticks. We have po poking out of lockers. We have petri dishes of stuff stuck in lockers. Every once in a while we have to go through and just sort of clean them out, not knowing that biomes were left there for a few months. This is playing handbells outside. Why not? By the way, handbells is now part of curriculum. How this was generated in its part. And um, the very, very best way for you to, uh, if I had a school that was not process driven, was not, I had to inspire, I would go to Chris. And I would say to him, Chris, we want to create lots of integration and lots of hands on and experiential and cognitive learning. I'd go to him. And you know why I'd go to him? He's a fine arts major. Go to your, that's step one, if, you, if you're really trying to encourage hands-on experiential learning, go to your ancillary studies. Go to your art teacher, number one. And the metamorphic rock didn't come out of an art teacher. It came out of a lower school science teacher. But I'd go to a fine arts teacher and say, help me bring curriculum and art and music together because it will inspire every content and classroom teacher. There's an artist, a musician, a dramatist, a, somebody who's interested in exercise or physical education. In every classroom teacher, you've got to find that and utilize that for developing curriculum in meaningful ways. Um, this was a... Uh, these are fifth graders, and they're studying sound, by the way. Now I recall that a little bit better. Lots and lots of building. I don't know what this is about, but here is a child, one-on-one, -on -one, building, making, creating their very own. My art teacher, seven years ago, decided that she wants to bring the constructivist approach to her art room. So we took out all the um, bins and all the cabinets, and we just put these tubs up on shelves, huge, big plastic tubs. And in those tubs, she put stuff of every imaginable sort, most of which I wanted to throw away. And yet, she said to students, sometimes in lower school, she would present a small fact on her smart board or a small idea like color or texture or fiber. And then as students got older and got exposed to all of the elements of art, she stopped doing that. And she said to them, let's create. What kind of ideas do you have to create? And she could not believe where students went with their ideas once they were freed up to use multimedia. And especially middle school students went crazy. Nobody in middle school would go to art unless they were absolutely forced to do so until we started the constructivist approach with art. And, that, and every student, students that were dead set to be the best soccer player in the world, 
students that were only mathematicians, they all went after the opportunity to express themselves intellectually and artistically when they were given the freedom to do so. And after all, what is the purpose of art? Learning is to inspire more. But if I had a choice, I would be having my art teacher, I'd hire Chris, to bring that fine arts program into curriculum. So how do we do this? My teachers had at their, um, at their team meeting every week for an hour, and it, they, they can invite anybody they want to on campus. So my fourth grade teacher might invite my middle school physics teacher. And sometimes we would invite the art teacher, and sometimes we'll invite the music teacher. Because that teacher wants her curriculum or his curriculum to come alive, and they know that they might be able to have some inspiration by working with the humanities team. Sometimes they invite a social worker or a psychologist or a, um, a, a psychotherapist because they're having behavioral difficulties with a particular student. And so they need help in how to manage this situation and how to get more possibility and how to fix the situation. This is process driven. This is, um, this is individualization. So this is the first grade classroom. The only thing that you see that was bought and purchased is the sign, welcome to first grade. Everything else, the writing, the paper, the sons, whatever the case may be, is all generated out of students. Whether we're talking about multiplication facts or we're talking about written stories or we're talking about sons. It is all created out of students, not out of duplication. Hannah's family. This is a student who is in kindergarten. And when you give students an opportunity to express themselves, they will do it uniquely. And what are we looking for? We're looking for acceleration, and we're looking for creativity. And this is a way to get it. No two bodies are alike, not in any class. The school as a system must employ individualization processes, must engage students in creative, integrative, and cognitive thinking and curriculum. And how do we do that? We do that by collaboration. Collaboration with our students and collaboration with our teachers. Integration, so that in every part of the day, there is thinking and planning and an opportunity to blend what you know. Today I had a great story. Was it N Noah? Noah told me a story. Noah, where, Noah, wave at me. Noah, this is Noah. Noah's told me that he used to be in aeronautic engineering, but now he's in computer technology. And, I said, he, said, and he was like, I know it seems a li little bit odd, but I said, bravo for you, because you're going to be able to use amazing possibility in this regard. Noah, I'm guessing, is in his 20s. So when we start having that opportunity with younger and younger children to integrate what they learn, how they learn it, and the amount that they learn, they are going to go so much farther and build so many more connections in the brain. Number three, teachers need support and students need support. And so we use a method called the triple O. So teach, students come to me, I want to create an outcome. What opportunities do you have for creating that outcome? And it's my job and the teachers' jobs and all of the adults in their world is to remove the obstacles. And that's the same thing we do with teachers and teacher evaluation. We do it about three times a year. We meet together. And the question is, what are some outcomes you want to create? And that's how we moved all the furniture out of our art room and bought diff completely different stuff for her to work on. That's how we you know, reinvent ourselves and improve ourselves. That's how we manage our students better and better and better. So we create outcomes. And we think of opportunities, 
for creating those outcomes. And for the most part with my teachers, it's my job to remove the obstacles. And sometimes that means doing it with other team members, and sometimes it means me supporting their own child, or it means getting materials that they need. And so I offer to those of you in leadership, it is your job to imp for improvement, as Dr. Deming said. But on the other side of improvement, you must remove the obstacles. It's your job. Last week, a very good friend of mine, who is a very important consultant in the healthcare field, got asked to speak to a Baldridge awarding, awarded school on teachers. They were going to spend two days talking about teacher evaluation. So for a good many hours before this person was going to be part of this teacher evaluation panel, in the middle of all that, guess what was happening in Chicago over teacher evaluation? So at first I was just listening and sort of redirecting and re-guiding the thinking, because this person's not an educator. And I knew that he had to speak on teacher evaluation. So about after the fourth or fifth hour of us talking about teacher evaluation, and after he had told me that we shouldn't be working, that most systems only fire about the bottom two or three, which we heard David talk about very cleverly today, I thought, and you're working on teacher evaluation of that 86%? Maybe you better be working on supporting the 86% instead of evaluating them. And that was like the, I almost fell through the ice at that point, or he almost th fell through the ice. He said, wait, just a minute. Uh, we're spending two days on this, and so... A couple of days went by, and he said to me, if I heard you correctly, this is slow learning, is that what he called it? If I heard you correctly, of all the things that you would change in a system, the last one would be teacher evaluation. And I said, if you, wanted, if you had 100 things that you wanted to work on a system, God forbid, if you had four, that you were going to work on to improve a system, number four, number 99, would be teacher evaluation. Put your effort into removing the obstacles for teachers. Because in this room, we all know. We know what to do. We know how to do it. What in the world is keeping us from doing it? We've got to start doing it, making it happen. So if you're a student, as a rookie, it's your job to make it happen. If you've been in the system for 40 years and you haven't made it happen, shame on you. Because that's the only way it's going. We all are like looking outside in the universe for American schools to change. It's got to start by us making it happen. And it doesn't matter exactly how old you are. This man is my physics teacher. He's only been teaching for three, this is his third year. He came to me right out of undergraduate school. He didn't know anything about adolescents and less about third graders. And even less about six-year-olds. He's the one who set the fire, set a fire in his lab, uh, set his lab table and carpet afire using alcohol, and all of my first graders came running to me going, Mr. Bond is setting the school on fire. And I said, is the carpet black? Is Mr. Bond okay? And they said, yes. And they ran back to Mr. Bond and said, Mr. Bond, you are amazing. And they were only six years old. And they won't ever think about fire and chemistry and flammability the same way that they thought about it on that day. And they will be phys phys physicists. 
and they will be aeronautical engineers. They will be something great because someone is doing more than just giving, pouring the information into them. Someone is igniting the fire of learning and keeping it going, accelerating the movement. You have to accelerate what, how much is students are receiving. And that is our job as educators. You know that there are students who need more in your classroom. It is your responsibility to give it to them, to create it for them by one means or another. And it's a great opportunity to do it. I'm not such a nice person sometimes. And that's because I really care about this field of education. I've been in it for 40 years. 30 years in a school that Dr. Deming helped me, inspired me to create. And guess what? He never said to me, Betty, do this and this and this. He depended upon me to do it. And that was the most important thing that he gave to me. He didn't tell me how to do it even. He told me to do it. And then he said, sat and ate cookies with my students. Simple as that. He just depended upon me. And so today, I'm depending on you. Because you're the only ones that can do it. You have the know-how. You have the capability. And you have the inspiration because you're here today. So you have to go back and inspire others to do the same thing. Because I'm pretty sure that, as I said to Nick earlier, is that when we combine accelerating achievement of American students and businesses building more and more great ideas, that that will produce the exact thing that we need in our economy and in our world. And that's for Nick's benefit and Noah's benefit and your benefit and Chris's benefit as a principal. And me, because I have three grandchildren who are following in that process. Thank you so much. I will be happy to answer questions one-on-one -on -one with you because I think that's the best way that I can share my triple O with you. I want to share it with you today. So if anybody has a problem, I'd be willing to bring it up to the group so that you can use, help people have an outcome you want to create and you don't know what to do, how to do it. Anybody have one? I would be happy to, I'm not sure I can remove all the obstacles, but I can give you some opportunity right here in this group. So anyone welcome to do that, please come, because I've got lots of resources and I know them. Thank you.